one of our guests today actually climbed a Roman castle in the country of Turkey. Stay tuned to find out who. He's a Florida witch with something to say. Your friendly old sage may have a teddy bear face. The Alexia Show, the magic's on its way. He's all set to play, so let's not delay. Welcome to Alexia Show. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alexian, and this is the very first episode of the Alexian Show. I'm so excited to be here and bring you this interactive show. Um, and I have some amazing guests lined up. Where's everybody tuning in from today? Talk to us in the comments. It is an interactive show, and I do want you to participate by asking questions for our guests we can actually display them right on the screen and ask them live because we're here together in this process and in this event. So exciting. Um, so um, let me look at the comments. We've got uh, Blessed Be, excited to be here. David Garcia, hey David, how you doing? Blessed Be, love you man. Mel is in the house. Hey, Mel. Yay. I love you to death, too. This is also one of my private students in Wicca. Uh, Janet is from Ohio. Thanks for tuning in, Janet. Sandy. Sandra's in the house. Hey, Sandy. Sandy's in Alabama. Eric. How cool to spell your name that way. A E R. -E. I-K. I've never seen that before. I love that. Elaine Brown. Hey, honey. Mexico. That's awesome. I'm so happy you tuned in to join us today. Love you lots. David is in Palm Bay. Mel is, of course, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yep, Alabama. Uh, Therese is in Florida. We just got people from all over. I am so excited. It's going to snowball every month. We're doing this show once a month. Mark your calendars once a month on the first Sunday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern. But better yet, give this video a like right now. First of all, you know, that little like button, it's free to click. And that tells the, um, the algorithm to push it out to people so that they know that there's a show happening. But better yet, subscribe. and click the bell so that you get notified and then you don't have to remember. All right. Before we even go any further, I have to say this. I want to, from my heart, from my heart, say a special thank you to Melissa Anderson. Yes, honey, you hear me. I'm talking to you, Melissa Anderson. You are the one that has inspired this show to even exist, all of your encouragement and your positive words to make this happen, and all of the wonderful, fabulous things that you do, not only for me, but for all of us in the community um, and all of your endeavors that you have strived for in life. You're just really an awesome lady, and I respect you highly. So I wanted to say thank you so much for, you know, poking me. <laughs> <laughs> to do it because without those pokes, I may not have gotten off my butt and did it. All right. So now I need to introduce to you my co-host, Draken. Hey. How Hello. You doing? <laughs> I'm, doing I'm glad to be here. Now, where uh, are you? Where are you at? Tell the tell the viewers. I'm in Springfield, Missouri. You are in Springfield, Missouri. That's where I was born with Springfield, Missouri, and a hospital there. I was raised on a small farm not far away. And in fact, Draken and I went to high school together. We have known each other for a minute or two. Or two. We even did um, drama together in high school. And I re <laughs> do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> do you remember when we went to state? I do. Do, do you want to like... Do we want to like admit to what it was called? <laughs> sure, absolutely. 
It was called The Night I Met Harold Klunkenheimer. That's right. And we made it to like second in state or something with that. <laughs> oh, my God. So, like, if I remember correctly, it was like the week before the competition in drama. And our drama instructor said, we need somebody to do a duet act. And I want you guys to do it. And here's a script. And we we're like, oh, okay. And we kind of freaked <laughs> out because we we're like, this is going to suck because we had been practicing and rehearsing for months for this competition in drama. And uh, we were thrown this script like the week before the competition. And so we we're like, well, we're not going to stress it. We'll do our best. So we, <laughs> we did this sketch that was an amorous young uh, woman, an ang amorous young girl played by Draken. I don't know which side she's on on your screen. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, this very shy young boy, right? And so she is all over me in this duet act and I'm kind of like shying away, you know, how appropriate, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gay. If you didn't know, hello. <laughs> um, and uh, so we went to competition and we freaking won. And then we went to state for the yeah. whole state of Missouri and like competed. And they called us up on stage with all these other people. And we're thinking, oh, well, we got like, you know, we're number 10 or something. Right. People kept getting awards and disappearing, getting awards and disappearing. Before you knew it, there were only two couples left. And we came in second place. We were like in shock that we got a second place at drama in state for a, a duet act. So here we are. But you know what? 40, we're 40, 40, 40, 40 years later, <laughs> posting a show on YouTube about paganism. You got to love how things work out, eh? Yeah. Um, of course, you also uh, discovered my Coven of Cool Cats online community, and yeah. you joined that, and you started... Yeah. Uh, participating and learning uh, about paganism and Wicca. And then one thing led to another. And now you want to tell them? Yeah. yeah. Now I'm a private well, student. Student. Uh, Wicca. I, just, uh, I, I'll just say I had prior religious trauma and how I was raised. And so I had been anti-organized religion for decades. And even though Alexi and I had talked about this, I was like, mm, it's organized religion. Thanks, but no thanks. But eventually I figured out that it was nothing like what I had experienced before. And so now I'm a student and um, with my uh, good friend, Galena, we are, we are on our way. Yes. You're doing great. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, we have class every other week online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, and then I, I'm like stressed out beyond belief because I have so many things and so many irons in the fire. I ended up hiring her as an assistant and then I asked her to co-host this show with me. And here we are. Yeah. Good time. I love you. I love you. I love you too. I love you lots. Hey, I love you more. Saying hi in the chat. Hello. Thank you for welcoming me. I appreciate it. And yeah, you can show those chats on, on the screen too. Don't forget that. Okay, um, we got to show this one because this is my girl. Hey, nah. sis, we're sisters now. So, yeah, uh, that's my other private student. Mm -hmm. They're learning together at the same time. Hi, Mel. Nice to meet you. And then we've got Janet. Hello. You know what's exciting? This is like the first time anyone but you or Galena has called me Draken, and I'm very excited about that. Yes, it spreads. Exactly. You see this? This is about you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say this and somebody else has already said it for me. Yeah. Yeah. He's always been shy. I, I'm not shy anymore. <laughs> he, he wasn't shy back then either. So, so Draken, Draken is going to definitely be covering the, the comment section in YouTube. So if you have comments or questions for our guests, again, don't be shy. Ask about them. But before we go any further, Draken, I thought I would talk about the show for the future and our different categories that we have. Yeah. In case somebody's watching or even seeing the replay, they may want to apply to be a guest on the show in the future, right? Yeah, so awesome. I'm only going to do this one time at the very first show. So these are our 
segment categories. Okay. Um, we've got um, pagan parenting. So this is if you have experience being a father or a mother to a young child who is also, you know, being raised in a pagan household. You know, do you have ideas on what to teach them and what to share with them? This could include things like crafts for kids, games, stories, all sorts of things like that. So if you know anything about pagan parenting, definitely consider applying to be on the show. And I'll share it with you in a moment on how to do that. Another category is magical moments. This is about paranormal or magical experiences that you've had in your life. This could be anything from a UFO to Bigfoot to a ghost experience to just even doing magic, but having an incredible result and how it manifested in your life. And the next category is one of my ex favorites. I'm very excited about this one. Fur, feather, scale, and skin. We want to bring onto the show our animal and plant familiars, okay? So if you have a familiar that is bonded with you magically and is always in circle with you or is close by to you and you have a special bond with this animal, we would love to have you guys on to, to show the animal to the rest of the community and introduce them. Another category is Garden of Shadows, which is herb magic. So if you know anything about the magics of herbs and spices, not cooking, but like literal doing spell work, this would be that category. The next category is Enchanted Verse. Now, this is for our poets and our lyricists. So on this show, even though I am a pagan musician, and even though we have a pagan musician today, we're not going to be doing music on the show. What we're going to be doing is the lyrical sharing. So we're really going to break the song down and analyze the lyrics and the meanings behind the lyrics and, you know, the inspiration of where they got those from. And of course, that applies to poetry as well. Crafts for spell work. Now, this is literally craft. So if you have a spell, but you have to make something, right? Um, uh, Breed's Cross would be a, a, a good example. Um, weaving, um, creating, um, sewing, uh, sculpting, you know, anything that you have to do that's a craft for spell work, this is crafting magic. Then we have kitchen witchery. This is where you're actually using the correspondences of magic and throwing all those ingredients together to create a magical meal that then you imbibe into your body and absorb the essences of those magical intents. A very cool subject indeed. And we have a chef with us today. Pagan visual arts. I'm so excited. There are so many pagan artists out there and you all deserve the limelight, and I am here to bring it to you. Are you hearing me? I want you on my show. I love art, and I love all of the different ways it manifests, and I worship creativity, okay? I'm always saying this. If you want to be more godlike, be more creative. What's the ultimate definition of goddess, of God? The creators, right? If you want to be more godlike, be more creative. And I worship creativity. I always have and I always will. And visual arts inspire me and my soul to write good music. So we inspire each other. The next one is sacred storytelling. Now, this would be about myths, mythology, or stories that have like a moral point to them, right? Literally sitting down at a campfire and telling the story. We want you all to join in as well. And our last category is secrets from the pagan book chef. Yes, pagan authors. And we do have one with us today. I know I jumped the gun a little bit there, Draken, but I was so excited <laughs> about talking about the categories. I just wanted to get to it already. 
Um, but we do have a packed show for you today. Victor is here from spicegnome.com. Fingers. Yay. Uh, <laughs> um, Mama Gina is in the house, who is a pagan recording artist. Yay. And Orica Hecataios, Oracle Hecataios, who is a pagan author, is in the house today. Woo! And the other thing is, I'm almost done with this intro. You don't want to miss out on the Arcane Treasures giveaway at the end of the show. All of our guests and our sponsors have donated items for a free giveaway. And all you have to do is be present and enter online and we'll lead you through that process. It's really easy. You'll actually just comment a special code word and you're entered into the drawing, but that's at the end of the show. All right, did I miss anything? Oh, where do you go? If you do, <laughs> if you do wanna be a guest on the show, okay, you need to go to alexianmusic.com slash guest. It's that simple. Alexianmusic.com slash guest. There's a little form that you fill out there to apply. And that's that. How's the chat going? Uh, going pretty good. We got somebody in here now from Melbourne, Linda. Um, so it looks like we got people coming in from all over. So, Very I mean, cool. the fact that we've got Elena from Mexico. I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that. Yeah. Elaine. Yeah. Is it Elaine? Elaine. It's yeah. Elaine. Yeah. I know her. We'll talk about her and the project uh, uh, that we were involved in, in just a second. All right. Before we get started, if you haven't clicked that free like button, be a helper and please do so now. It triggers the algorithm to notify others that a live show is happening right now. And Draken, we'll be seeing you in just a bit. Bye. Okay, without further ado, let's get on with the show. The time is ripe for kitchen witchery. Okay, here we go. Our first guest today, I'd like to introduce you to Victor, the culinary wizard behind spicenome.com. His passion for cooking ignited at age 11 inspiring delectable dishes infused with tantalizing spices and herbs. His desire isn't just to provide recipes, but to inspire others to embrace the art of cooking by experimenting with diverse flavors and mastering new culinary techniques. Welcome to the magical world of Spice Gnome, where gnomes, spices, and red wine create unforgettable gastronomic experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, a maestro of the kitchen and my husband, Victor. Hey, everyone. <laughs> I love how you cut my picture in the, in the little thing in the beginning. When I used to have long dreads, I'd look fabulous. <laughs> oh, you liked that, did you? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a great picture of me. So, yeah, absolutely. So um, before we get started, tell us, tell the viewers, tell, tell us the story about how you got started cooking at age 11. So I come from a family of cooks. My mom, my grandma, they all love to cook. And I love to watch. I love to eat. I've always loved to eat. But I love how they could take just raw stuff and suddenly make something so delicious. So. Um, I convinced my mom to let her help her. So I, at 11 years old, I started to make rice, just white rice, because we're Puerto Rican. And when you're Puerto Rican, rice is on every meal. It's like, if you don't have rice, you didn't eat. So I started to make rice. And then I started to make beans, because rice goes with beans. Um, and then I started to cook everything to the point that when I was in high school and first year in college, I was doing all the cooking in my house. Everybody else was cleaning the kitchen because I was not a fan of cleaning the kitchen, but I did the cooking. And, you know, I started to, I had to train my family to my experiments 
because uh, I cannot see a recipe and just go with it. I have to take a recipe and add my touch. So I started to make some of the stuff that I learned to make from my mom and my grandmothers, but I started to add my things. And my dad was the one that took a little bit longer to adjust because he's, it was very traditional in the way that he ate. But yeah, you know what? At the end, he was fine. He learned. I remember um, when they came to visit the first time after I had met you, and we were looking, you know, for something fast and we went to a fast food restaurant. And I remember that some of your family were not happy that there was no rice and beans served with their burger. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's no rice and beans. That's not dinner. That's just, you know, an appetizer. In Puerto Rico, they actually do serve rice and beans with the burger. Yeah. KFC, yeah. thank you very much. They have uh, rice and beans, Puerto Rican style rice and beans. So I used to be skinny. <laughs> Before I met Ooh, Victor. So was I. What are you talking about? You tell the story about the fridge. Oh my God. So I go to visit him and I go to his apartment and I open his fridge and there was a box of pizza and a bottle of ketchup. That's it. And I'm like, Oh my God, what is wrong with these people? These people are starving. I mean, what the heck? He comes to my house and he opens the fridge and he said, how many people live here? And I'm like, just me. What's with all that food? I have to have food to cook. I mean, it was, I, it was literally one of those instances where you had to go grab clothes or otherwise it would be it would just fall on you all of the food would just fall out of the fridge you have to have food to cook if you don't have stuff how are you gonna cook i'm not gonna go to the store every time i want to make something and then i went to puerto rico and i opened his mother's fridge and i went ah okay yeah it's, it's a I family learned from tradition. her it's a family tradition <laughs> <laughs> so what yeah, are you, my grandma was the same too what are you sharing with us today okay so today we're gonna talk about food for Ostara or the spring equinox. Um, <clears throat> I just came up with some few ideas of things that you can do. Uh, Ostara is a time of fertility, it's a time of renewal. So the foods that we make for Ostara go with that same thing. So one of the first, the most common things is eggs. Eggs are a symbol of fertility. So I made, Devil eggs, everybody makes devil eggs, but it's because they're so delicious and everybody loves them. So I make horseradish devil eggs. Uh, they have a little bit of uh, cumin, a little bit of coriander, salt, pepper, a little bit of um, Worcestershire sauce. And then I put dill on top and they, I mean, not to brag, but they came out so good. I'm gonna try one here, even though I had already one, but. You know, I mean, I have to try the stuff that I make. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, spicy, oh man, that is good. Yeah, that's a winner. Very easy to make, people love them. You can make them uh, the day before and they'll be fine for the next day. I also made, I made before for cakes, uh, for ritual, I've made, Lavender and lemon shortbread. I love shortbread. That's my most favorite cookie is shortbread. And this lavender and lemon. Lemon and lavender are also um, herbs and fruits that you uh, are associated with um, uh, Ostara because this is the time when they're blooming. Lemons are blooming. Lemons are coming out. Lemons are the only citrus fruit that blooms more than once. Uh, usually citrus just blooms one and then you have a crop. Lemons, you have two or three crops in a year. So these cookies are awesome. They're not extremely sweet and you can taste the lavender, you can taste the lemon without being soap. So that's a winner. And then I had a one salad. earlier, they're delicious, especially <laughs> with coffee. Ah, uh, yeah, they're perfect with coffee. They're perfect with red wine, too. Uh, I made a salad. And, you know, 
Salads don't have to be boring. You can, you know, I added uh, chickpeas and uh, I put a little bit of color with tomatoes and strawberries. I put uh, purple onion because, you know, who doesn't like purple? Uh, a little bit of feta cheese. I always put a little bit of salt and pepper on the salad because, okay, so I love salt. So I always put a little bit of salt on everything. And then you can put some oil. You can put some olive oil. What I did is I put some garlic olive oil and it's so good and it's so easy. You can make it yourself. Uh, you can go and buy it in the store. No problem. Super easy. And a little bit, you can put lemon juice or you can put a little bit of rice vinegar. <clears throat> so for today, I'm going to cook and I'm going to make uh, rice with chicken. It's not, we have a dish, Puerto Rican dish we call arroz con pollo, but it's not going to be exactly an arroz con pollo. It's almost going to be like a stir fry rice um, with chicken. So uh, do you want me to start with? Uh... Okay. Yes. So, so he's going to go ahead and start cooking a bit. We're going to um, poke some fun and then we're going to move on with the show while he's cooking in the background and we'll bring him back at the end of the show. Yeah. So, so um, um, I'm just going to say what I'm going to put in the rice. Okay. Um, and then uh, I'll start cooking. Uh, I took some chicken thighs. You can use chicken breast if you want to. I prefer thighs because I love the taste uh, of the chicken thigh, uh, skinless. And then I seasoned them. And I seasoned them. I seasoned them yesterday. I made this. It's a Tuscan mix. And uh, it's an Italian seasoning. And it has a bunch of different herbs. But a cool thing about the herbs is that they have in common is they promote protection, love, and peace. Uh, oregano is for peace. Basil is for love and protection and money. Money is always good. Thyme is for purification and love. Rosemary is for protection and love. Marjoram is love and peace. Garlic for protection and health. Onion for protection, crushed red pepper for protection, lemon juice for purification and love, and olive oil for health, happiness, peace, and sex. So uh, when you cook, you can do magic. That's the thing, the cool thing about being a kitchen witch. You don't have to necessarily wait to be in ritual to do magic. You can do magic on your everyday cooking. You just use your ingredients and then you put whatever intentions you have in one to your cooking. Uh, you know how people say that, you know, food from your family, uh, it, it seems to come with more love. It's because when they're cooking, they're actually cooking for people that they love. So they're putting all that love into the food. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm just talking and I'm, I'm not ignoring your chat. I'm seeing you all. Um, so, when you cook, you can uh, do magic. So this is an example of something that you can make very easy and, um, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a magic, it's a, it's a spell that you're doing. Everybody that's gonna eat that is gonna be loving it and they're gonna be protected. They're gonna be uh, um, purified and, you know, it's all gonna be all good stuff. So. I'm going to stir fry the chicken. I'm going to brown it first. And then after it's brown on both sides, I already cut it them in like, you know, bite size. I'm going to add green peas. I mean, I'll cover them with my hand. And I'm going to add a whole bunch of purple onion because I love onions. And I'm going to add cabbage. All of this are things that are seasonal of this time. So they are all representative of the wind, the spring equinox. So, you know, it's, it's gonna be great. And then I'm gonna use rice. Rice is good for fertility. I'm gonna use brown rice because I love brown rice. So um, 
that's why I'm gonna use. I made the the rice. I made it yesterday because because it's gonna be kind of like a stir fry. We want the root the rice already cooked. What what we're gonna do later is we want the rice to take the flavor from the chicken and the vegetables. You know, it's gonna be all combined, and then it's gonna be delicious. And that's gonna be it. I don't know if you saw somebody just said you should make a cookbook. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that many times. Uh, from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and from almost others. every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, what is one of the most humorous or outlandish fan comments that you've ever received? <laughs> so I have a fan that I made in my website. I have a recipe for a crunchy chicken. It's super easy to make. But it's very, very good. It uses cornflakes and all the spices. And uh, you make it in the oven. It's really good. Addicting. So her husband, she made it one time. He is a fan. He watches this show. He doesn't cook, but he loves to watch the show. So he told her to make that. She made it one time, and then he was hooked. So then he required for her to make that at least once a week for months. So she was like, you know, I'm starting to get tired of the crunchy chicken. And I'm like, well, you know, it doesn't have to be chicken. You can use pork chops. So there she went home and she used pork chops. Now the husband required pork chops, crunchy pork chops for a long time. So finally he forgot. <laughs> so she doesn't have to make it all the time. So, um, Victor has donated to the Arcane Treasures giveaway a special uh, drink recipe because he does mixed drinks as well yes. on his website, SpiceGnome.com. And the special drink is called Give It To Me Sangria. Mm -hmm. And it works. Trust me. It, his sangria does work. He also is gifting this Kitchen Witch uh, magnet for your refrigerator. Um, yeah. Remember the 4th of July sangria party? Yes. Oh, ho, ho. So I made this sangria. We had a 4th of July party and, you know, it was kind of like a rambunctious party. Uh, one of the covenants brought a penis cake. So I made this sangria and the sangria, it was like, I threw everything in it. I mean, it was awesome. So uh, we had, <laughs> uh, she's going to kill me. Our high priestess decided she was just going to have the fruit because the fruit is healthy. So she just ate the fruit and she got trapped. But everybody else had this agreement. And there were several straight boys in the group. And yeah, we were making out with straight boys all over the place. It to was be, a good party. To be fair, the women instigated that. That is true. That is absolutely you have to true. Told to come and go from the uh, porch, from the screen porch. Remember? Yes. But yeah. I have never and kissed so many straight men in my life until that Fourth of July. <laughs> it was so, a yeah. great Fourth of July party. Victor Sangria is amazing and speaking of booze tell us about the story of the coven mate at heartland and the 12 bottles of meat <laughs> we have a coven mate that he was like 22 and um he was just having a good old time and we order box like two dozen bottles of mead ahead of time so by the time we got to heartland you know we had all these bottles of mead and he was just like a squirrel. He was, he would open a bottle and drink part of it and then hide it somewhere in the camp. And then open another bottle and then hide it. And we're like, man, where all the bottles of meat are going? It's the last day and we start to pack stuff. And we start to find all these bottles hidden in, in places. It's like, was it a squirrel that I was packing for winter or what? I mean, yeah. We, yeah, we must have found like 13 bottles of mead. Yeah, it was lit the whole time. holes everywhere around camp. Yeah. 
it was it was funny it was funny. all right it was a little so if you guys want to check out victor's uh recipes and his drink recipes just go to spicenome.com okay there's a little uh splash of his website and on that website he has lots and lots of recipes Ooh, i see coquito in the top left corner yeah. Yeah. i mean coquito if you have coquito once you will want it year round is really good i have tried many 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 different coquitos because rum is my drink and let me tell you that coquito recipe that is the coquito recipe <laughs> it is the best one ever it is so so good okay well we're gonna go ahead and move along but before we do let's bring draken back on and how's the chat going do we have any questions um I no questions so far, except for I'm just going to remind you, because I've also said this, you should do a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that might happen in the future. Yeah, definitely will. I keep saying it. It'll yeah. happen. It'll yeah. happen. All right, Victor, you start cooking, and I will see you both in just a little bit. All, All right. righty. Bye. Bye. So moving on with the show, here we go. It's time for Enchanted Verse. So it's my absolute delight to present to you the mesmerizing and fearless bard, Mama Gina. With a soulful blend of bluesy vocals and straight ahead acoustic guitar, Mama Gina weaves spellbinding tales that resonate with the wanderlust in all of us. As an honored recipient of the International Pagan Music Association's Female Artist Award, Mama Gina stands as a shining example of the talented pagan musicians who celebrate community and creativity. With her evocative storytelling and passion for healing the planet and each other through music, Mama Gina's presence is sure to uplift and inspire. Everyone, Mama Gina. Hey, how are you doing, Alexa? And I'm kind of like, was wow, thank you for all those kind words. <laughs> How's that for an intro? That's lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Truth be told, this is what I do. I type things up and then I go, okay, chat GTP, zhuzh it up. <laughs> Well, you and Chat GPT work well together. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. Well, you have become a dear, dear friend of mine. I know that we started to get together and get to know each other back in Lake Okeechobee at that. Yes, that was one heck of a festival, well, was it not? It was sizzling. <laughs> one of the I... most hottest events I've ever been to. Indeed, I agree. I, if if I ever say yes to a summer solstice outside in Central Florida again, just somebody knock me in the head. <laughs> we were, but it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was an incredible event. We all came home with sunburns and ten pounds lighter from <laughs> from sweating. And, you know, and mosquito bites and. <laughs> It was it was a lot of fun though. It was a great a great time, and it was at that that gathering I got to get to know you, and um, it was wonderful. And it seemed like we were both kind of in the same place in our lives that we were ending one chapter and moving through a transitional door to another chapter, right? Yes. And here we are. Yes, I was. Um, my son was graduating from high school. And um, I knew the next chapter was right around the corner. I was walking away from my paralegal job that I had had for years to raise him and um, stepping full on into the pagan, you know, the festival musical world and just it, failure was not going to be an option. I just was diving in. Yeah. You definitely took the bull by the horns and dove in because you've, You've done amazing things since that gathering, you know, and, and of course, one of the things that we did together was the red album. Yeah. Um, 
which I will show you now. <laughs> I'm still, sorry, it's live, guys. It's live. I got to remember to click the right buttons. But that project was very, very um, powerful. Yeah. Um, ooh, uh, so I was incredibly honored to be asked to be on this. Uh, incredible musicians were on the Red Album. You were one of them. Um, we, we all put our hearts and souls into this and, uh, it just, it was an amazing project to raise money for, um, reproductive rights for women's reproductive rights, not just pagan reproductive rights, but for women, for all humans. And, um, we are still selling, um, you know what, nine months later, we're still selling the Red Album digital copies and and USBs for your wrist that have all the music on it and no. some other perks. Um, it's just, it's, we were all passionate and I was excited that I was able to contribute. I really was. It was, it was an amazing process. And of course, Elaine Brown is in the house watching and she's commenting. She was our fearless leader. And oh my goodness, I have never met a lady, Elaine, uh, that was so organized and so, how do you put this? She, she had everything under control and she gently herded us cats you know, into the same direction. <laughs> and she, and, oh, 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 you know, she was just amazing at her job as producer with the Red Album. And I just love her to death. Love you. I do too. She also contributed a couple of songs, oh, yes, you know, absolutely. and it just, she was amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what have you been doing since the Red Album? Well, um, I did tour a little bit last year, uh, 23, through the summer. Uh, not a lot, but a little bit. And um, I took a hiatus. I took a hiatus. And in fact, when we met a couple of weeks ago to talk about this show, I still was considering a hiatus through most of this year. And I had a couple of things crack open um, inside me. And I am booking the summer like you wouldn't believe I'm going to be. Uh, I've got gigs already in Florida and North Carolina in April and May. And I'm going to be in the Midwest through June, July, August, September. And uh, I've got, you know, my fingers crossed for some other things at the end of this year. I, I went through, I guess you could call it a dark night of the soul. I That's went okay. through some crippling self-doubt about whether I was making a difference uh, with my music. And suddenly I had a lot of people reach out and say, oh, please don't stop. And you know what? It was enough to make me lift my head up and reach out and do the work that I needed to do. So um, I'm planning on writing a new album over this next year and a half. And um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be touring and playing live again, so I'm excited about that. I think I just needed a break. A friend of mine, Teresa Lutz, I think she's she's in our comment section. Uh, one of my dear friends looked at me the other day because we were talking about my downtime, and she said, "Sometimes you just need to be fallow," and it really hit me. And so I'm I'm I'm. I'm up and about and getting things done and getting ready for the 2024 tour. Amazing. Amazing. We, we all need that downtime. And I I'm convinced that every once in a while, we all need those dark periods too. It's, it's a way of purging. Right. right. And I myself had a, a dark eve. It was just one night, one night, I lost my shit. I went off the cliff. Victor talked me off the cliff, back pulled me back up, you know. And um, it's just there's a lot of um, it's a lot of stress, you know, doing what we do. People don't realize how much work it is behind yeah. the scenes. They just think, oh, we write some words down and strum some guitar, or play some piano and sing, and everything's hunky dory. There's so much more to it than that, you it's know. 
it it is laborious you know there's a whole physical side to it and that was part of my um my downfall i think <coughs> excuse me was that i am no longer able to do some of the physical things that i used to be able to do um age uh, broke this arm a couple of years ago and it's come back, but it has not come back a hundred percent. And so I have had to readjust my own expectations of myself. And it means I have to ask for more help when I do go out on the road. Um, hey, Mel, thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate that. I'm watching the chat come across. Uh, thanks, Drockett, for, for putting some of this stuff up for us. Um, yeah, I, I needed... I needed to go through this dark time, downtime to really reassess what I'm capable of. And the one thing that I'm still capable of is writing and and processing my world through my lyrics. So, yes. And even that in itself is a laborious experience. I mean, it's like giving birth. You know, when you write a song, it's a baby and you're you're proud of it but sometimes it's an ugly baby you know <laughs> sometimes it's not what you want but you Alexian, gotta get it out <laughs> alexi and i've given birth writing songs is not quite like giving birth, but i get what you're saying it, it you it, you don't always get what you expect sometimes you get nothing and sometimes you're incredibly surprised and and i will tell you this about giving birth um my son, Jesse, is in his uh, mid 30s now, almost, and, or early 30s. And um, not at all what I expected, but I'm incredibly proud of the man he's become. And he's been at the core of a lot of my songwriting for a very long time. Very nice. Very nice. So. Um, tell us about your last album, Never Trust a Girl with a Guitar. <laughs> right? Never Trust a Girl with a Guitar. Could what? be, a, a, you know, I I was looking back at my life over the last couple of years and doing some shadow work and uh, looking at my, re, at my, um, you know, the, 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 what I had had with other people, you know, my, it, it just, it, I kept looking back and wondering why I was still single after all this time. And I realized that the common denominator uh, between all of my relationships was me and that I just really had to write about that um, and come to terms with uh, who I am as a single person and who I sometimes become when I'm with other people and uh, still growing in that area. But I uh, never trust a girl with a guitar was uh the result of a lot of that. <laughs> and there right? she is. <laughs> yeah, look out for that girl. She's trouble because she will tell you, she will tell on you in her music. Um, you know, I'm not Taylor Swift who's written about all of my relationships, but you will find a lot about my old relationships scattered throughout my <laughs> about throughout my music in the last uh what, 15, 20 years. Ah, uh, good stuff. <laughs> All right. So you are doing Enchanted Verse today. So that means yes. you get to read some lyrics to us. So I'm going to give you the stage and let you enchant us. All right. Um, I'm just going to do the lyrics and we can talk about it later. Hush now. Evil walks. Breathe you soft and be still. Quiet now. Doors are locked. You are on your own, and I'm not here. If you live, run to me. If you go, find me in my dreams. Hush now. Evil walks. Breathe you soft and be still. Breathe ye shallow and be still. So that, um, that was me processing the Uvalde massacre a couple of years ago. 
And um, this is how I process the world around me and my internal world, both of those things. This is how I process. I write lyrics. I write music. And I realized I didn't have enough anger um, that I wanted to hold in my body anymore because anger hurts my bones now. I, I didn't want to hold it within me. But to process that massacre of school children, um, I needed a lullaby, and that's what I wrote. And I actually um, went back and studied lullabies a bit before I even sat down to begin to write it. I, I, um, I learned that lullaby as as a genre has some very specific things going on. And if you go out and listen to the music, there's very little going on in the music. It's a very simple, simple tune behind the lyrics. There are very few lyrics and they actually repeat. Um, it's soft and gentle, even though this was an act of violence. The lullaby itself is to keep our children quiet. When I say hush now, right? I, this is what we do with lullabies is we know that there's a monster at the door. And so we ask them to be silent, to be quiet, not even to make the sounds with our breath. Um, and that was Uvalde Lullaby. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the hardest songs that I do live, but I do it live. Um, because as much as I love to make people laugh, I also love to make them feel something deeply and weep. And um, we all get in a similar space. And um, I was so grateful that that lyric and that song came to me. So. It's very powerful indeed. Thank you. Yeah. It, I mean, I, you know, before the show, you told me which, which song you songs you were going to, to read. And I went to read it and I was just like, you know, blown away. And, um, and I almost regretted my decision when, because I didn't realize you were going to try to keep this show all light and everything. No, 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 no. But, Art but is, that's fine. That's it felt, fine. it felt important even, even here. Um, like I said, it's one of the scariest things I do on in front of an audience ever, Yeah, you know, is to bring that bring them to that horrible place all together yeah. at the same time. I feel oh, the same you, way about my red album song, born of crime. It's, I right. mean, when I was trying to record it, I, I started crying spontaneously because the emotion of the song and, and every time I perform it, the audience just gets quiet and you can hear them like, you know, cause they're in shock from the lyrics, you know, um, yes. But it's real. It's real. This is reality. This is what happens sometimes, you know, so. That was such a powerful song on the Red Album. And it's, I don't know if you've had this experience live, but when I do, um, there are a couple of songs that I do, but when I do You All Day Lullaby, it's always like this. I play the song and at the end of it, there is literally no sound except some people sniffing, but there is no applause there is literally nothing. And as a performer, that is one of the most frightening things to hear at the end of a song. And I finally realized that was what the appropriate response was supposed to be. And they were absolutely right in their response. And so I've learned to sit with that for a little bit and then pull everybody back into something lighter. And I will tell you that at the end of my concert, I very often have school teachers come up to me and say, I, I had a vice principal walk up to me of a grade school. Uh, I was playing in uh, Wisconsin last summer and he came up to me afterwards and he bought every bit of my music for that one song. He said, this is what I worry about 24 seven every single day those babies in my classrooms and for all the dark night of my own freaking soul where i don't know if i'm making a difference and all of that it's these people that come to me and tell me that it's resonating that remind me that i have to <laughs> 
I have to keep going because there might be another song like that that makes people actually feel something incredible. So absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, art, no matter what form it takes, is healing and it goes beyond us. You know, it really does. I, I've had songs that have been just given to me. I, I didn't write them. They just came through me, you know. You know what I'm talking about. I absolutely do. And, um, <laughs> and it's our job to put that out into the world because they're being divinely inspired by the, you know, our muses, our gods, whatever you want to call it. The universe is screaming, you know, WTF. <laughs> Yes. What are you doing? Yes. <laughs> Wake up, people, right? So it's our job as artists to express that and put it out into the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm so uh, thankful for you um, being in our pagan, you know, space um, in the community because you are cherished, whether you realize it or not. And you are loved and you will always that. be, you will Thank always you. be. <laughs> and you're also gracious because you have donated to the arcane treasures giveaway, a digital download code code for the entire album of never trust a girl with a guitar. Yes. So, yes. You guys that are watching, you could win all of these goodies with one spin of the wheel at the end of this broadcast. So don't go away. All right. So I hear that you're also doing mixing. Yes, I am. I am, uh, you know, over those two years, two years uh, that the world shut down that we shall not, we shall not name. Uh, I had to sit back and make a list of what I was good at and what I was not and how much of it I could make money at over those couple of years to survive, you know, keep the roof over the head and the groceries coming in. And um, I decided that I was going to take a plan that I had set out for about five, six years from that point and instead implement it over COVID. And I wound up building a small bedroom studio. And for those two years, I very actively took mixing classes online, mixing and production online. Uh, I found a great online school that uh, even though there were only a couple of women that ever showed up in all of our classes, I never once felt like I was the odd person out and I always felt safe in the environment. These people were about the music, not about who was making it. And um, a lot of encouragement. And I learned the basics of mixing and production. And I, I didn't know that I was going to love it, but I knew that I had to find some other ways to make music, to make a living, right? And it turns out, I absolutely love producing. I absolutely love mixing. I'm learning to master and I'm having friends that are sending me their work now. And I just mixed the last two uh, full albums for Marin King. I mean, mixing, producing, mastering, did the whole thing. She's trusted me with her music that's straight out of her heart and soul. So I'm grateful. We have another friend, Sage, here in the in Central Florida that has shared their music with me. And I've been able to do a couple of songs for them that they've released on Bandcamp. And um, it's picking up. And so I'm really excited that that's going to be an additional way for me to share my gift and my love of music and it kind of takes the pressure off because it's not about me it's about the songs totally mm -hmm. you know i it's just so great and it's lifting up other musicians who are just coming into the community over the last two three years it's lifting them up and giving them an opportunity to get their music out on Bandcamp. and you know i may not be out in nashville but I do a pretty darn good job of mixing and producing stuff. Oh, you're doing great. I'm very impressed. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that because you got really good ears. Um, but it's just, it's given me an opportunity to help 
some of my friends up and let them get their music out in the world. And I'm proud, so proud of them for taking the chance and grateful that they took a chance on me to help them with their work. So that's going to continue even long after I stop touring, which is still going to be at least two or three more years now. <laughs> well, you heard it here. If you are an up and coming Peggy musician, or probably any musician, yeah. um, and you need somebody to help you mix your music and get it mastered, reach out to Mama Gina. Absolutely. And one, I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole not, the reason you're excited about it, it's a whole nother creative skill. It's an it, art unto itself, right? You, you know what's funny is I have always heard all this music in my head as I've written. And as I play live, there are always strings. There are always horns. There are always drums. There are always bells and whistles and you name it. But I have never, I had never up to that point, even when I went in the studio, I had never had enough money to explore to try out all of those things. I had to learn the material so that I could play it to the best of my ability on a guitar and sing it and go into the studio and get it knocked out as quickly as possible because time is money in a studio. Um, and suddenly I had a little bit of money and all the time in the world. So learning these new skills and realizing, <gasps> I have all the time in the world. The world is not coming back in the next day or two. It's going to be months. And I realized I could take all the time I wanted to figure out that string part that I heard in my head or to play that guitar solo, even if I had to play it five notes at a time. You know, I, I had I could experiment with harmonies and all the things that I heard in my head and make them happen and to be able to do that for other people and open up their their musical world it's it's just so amazing and the other thing i'm doing because i know time is money with the studio i'm structuring what i do for other people in a very different way financially it's not about how much time i spend on the music we agree on a price at the beginning of a project and we agree on what I'm going to do with the projects and we make it work within their budget and I let them know what I can do. And if it takes more time than I thought, that's on me because it's about their music and doing the right thing for their music. And it's, it's really, it's allowing some people who couldn't be in the studio otherwise to have their music heard. And, um, it's, I'm just happy that I can do it and and make a little bit of money doing it too. So That's no awesome. complaint. <laughs> That's awesome. And you make good cloaks too. <laughs> oh yeah, I do. I do a little bit of that. You know, it's funny. I, I don't think artists aren't monolithic, right? We don't just create in one oh, no. avenue or aspect of our lives. I went through about 10 years of polymer clay because it gave me that physical way to, you know, if I could press my thumbprint into a piece of clay as I was making a piece of jewelry, I saw an immediate, an immediate result of how I can change my universe just by pressing myself into it a little bit. And I've always sewn my whole life. Um, and when the ideas about the cloaks started swirling in my head, tie cloaks started swirling in my head a few years ago, I just, I was standing in a store and all these ties were in front of me and all of a sudden I could see everything. You know, you know how sometimes you hear that whole song before you even sit down oh, with the yeah. guitar or keyboard, you hear the whole song or you wake up I and get, it's in your I head. I get music videos. I get music videos and I write the song to what I'm seeing in my head. Right, right, right. And so I saw the whole cloak and I saw how it came together. I saw the entire process and I went home and wrote like pages of how to put this whole thing together. And since then I've made a ton of cloaks in the last, what, 10 years or so. Um, there are people all around the country that are wearing a Mama Gina and there's not that many cause I can only make a few each year. But um, it's a way for me to be creative when I don't feel like picking up the guitar. Mm -hmm. Or I don't feel like singing, which is 
that's when I'm really depressed. If I, if I don't, if I don't feel like singing, I know there's something wrong with me, but I can still pick up fabric and create something beautiful and make that sewing, setting up the table, setting up the machines, getting them threaded, getting the fabric together, creating this thing, and then finding the perfect home for it. That is a ritual. That is a full on life ritual. And I love it every time it happens. So yeah, one more way for me to create. If you are in need of a cloak or <laughs> if you are in need of mixing and mastering, head over to mamaginamusic.com and reach out to her. I'm sure she would be happy to hear from you. Yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what are you working on now? So right now I am actively working on booking, which is uh, unfortunately one of my least favorite things to do, but I am scheduling out the summer. I have a lot of stuff booked already. I will be in the Midwest for much of it uh, through the summer and uh, booking small venues, a lot of house concerts. I've got some festivals going on in Wisconsin, Illinois. Uh, I'm gonna take a side trip to visit my son who has moved with his uh, partner, my son in love. Uh, they have moved uh, out just across uh, the bridge from Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, they're, in, they're in the Minnesota, they're in Minnesota. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about going to see them. I haven't seen my son in about a year and a half. So it'll be two years before <laughs> I get out there this summer. And I'm excited to uh, give them both a hug and uh, also visit a whole lot of friends this summer as I travel. Um, I have a prospect, but it is not uh, done yet, but I've applied for a residency in Northern Missouri for an artist residency. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed uh, that they say yes. Yes, indeed, indeed, all the fingers are crossed. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping very much that they accept my residency application. If that happens, I will be spending the winter up in Northern Missouri and very, very excited about uh, writing uh, my next album there. And if by some chance the residency does not happen, I will still be writing this year. And by next spring, like a year out, I expect to have uh, some new material for everybody. It'll be um, less pagan focused. I've been shifting a little bit because I've been trying to broaden uh the people that i sing for i find i love i love so much my pagan family but very often i feel like i'm singing to the choir and <laughs> it's kind of nice sometimes to step into a room where there are all these people who have never heard you before sure and have people come up to me after after an a, a, an hour and a half two hour concert and say I never thought about that that way before. And to have the opportunity to make people feel something that's outside of their comfort zone, but have them in a place where they're comfortable enough to feel it, mm -hmm. that it's hard, but it's knocking my socks off. So I'm not, not playing the pagan community anymore. I'm still definitely at lots of pagan festivals and house concerts, but I'm also pushing a little bit for some other venues where I'm going to be in front of people who may not have heard these types of ideas before. It's amazing. You went from, I'm going to take a hiatus and the goddess said, not. <laughs> I think I needed to, I think I needed to say it out loud because yeah. I'd already been on hiatus and I'd just been hiding. I literally, there were days where I didn't leave my covers, you oh. know, and it, it, it's not good. You know, I, I even, and I have family that I live with. And just a few weeks ago, my sister walked into my bedroom and I had just said with you, I, I, I think I'm going to take a hiatus this year. I'm not going to tour. And I was I was not in a good place and my sister and we listen we have a half of our family background is german we don't talk about feelings 
We never talk about feelings, right? The Italian half has nothing on the German half. We never talk about feelings. And my sister walked in my room and said, are you okay? And I burst into tears and I said, I'm really not. And I said, but I will be, but I will be. And these last few weeks, um, things have started to finally turn around. I don't feel hopeless. I don't feel helpless anymore. And I've got a lot of family and friends who love me enough to tell me that they can get me through this. So I have a lot of support, which is really great. Like I said, you are loved. I, I know it and appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing such things with us and, 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 you know, bearing your heart and your soul and your art with us. You're Thank not you. going anywhere. You get to sit yep. in from here on. So hang out and comment and, and all of that. But I'm going to go ahead and talk about our sponsors now, because without our sponsors, this would not be possible. And by the way, we are actively looking for pagan minded businesses and services that would be interested in sponsoring future shows. And if this sounds like you head over to alexian.com slash sponsor. You see how easy I make it. <laughs> if you want to be a guest, it's slash guest. If you want to be a sponsor, it's slash sponsor. Easy peasy. You can have your logo right down there like Morgana Magic Spells is now, which I'm going to talk about now. So Morgana, Rowan Morgana, I love her to death. I, I meet with my sponsors online so I can get to know them before the show. And um, she is out of Vancouver, Canada, actually on, Va on Vancouver Island. And she says it's very, you know, close knit community out there. And Rowan told me that she had gone through some rough times in her life. And then she found the goddess and she didn't start her journey into the craft until she was well into her forties. And then she found herself reading and reading and reading a lot. And then she started practicing little by little by little. And she discovered in her practice that she had a knack for writing spells. So upon request from friends, she started writing spells for others. Fast forward 15 years later, she found Etsy. And so here is her website, uh, MorganaMagicSpell.com. And it is filled with all sorts of things. She's got over 385 listings on Etsy alone. And her website, MorganaMagicSpell.com, is full of love. And in fact, she sent me this gorgeous um, PDF of Bossed after she found out that my matron goddess was Bossed. And this is printable, guys. This is what she makes. She makes PDFs that are spells with all of these beautiful graphic artwork. It's an art into itself, graphic arts. But she writes the spell work and everything herself that are in, contained within these PDFs. And then all you do is you download them and you print them out and you can put them into your book of shadows. You can hang them up on the wall. You can keep them on your iPad in digital format. You know, have a digital BOS, you know, whatever you want. Her thing is that she wants to share the same magic with the world that helped her find her happiness and her true path which is the magic of the goddess. And she has donated to the Arcane Treasures giveaway this gorgeous Astaro booklet. It is 24 pages long, and it's filled to the brim with all sorts of spell work and correspondences relating to Ostara. So again, that's coming up at the end of the show. Now, you may be familiar with paganmusic.com that is owned by Victor, my husband and I, we actually uh, formed earth tone studios back in 1993. I met Victor in 92 and we were hand fasted in 93. 
and shortly after we formed Earth Tone Studios. And then in 97, it became paganmusic.com. And of course, we sell pagan music and books and bumper stickers and all sorts of stuff on the website. Well, now it's been over 30 years and we're liquidating our stock. We've held on to some titles for so long that they've become out of print and collector's items. But our goal is to liquidate the store and turn it into an informational hub about pagan music and continue supporting the music. And paganmusic.com is happy to donate a $25 cart checkout coupon for the Arcane Treasures giveaway at the end of the show. We trust that it will bring the lucky winner some pagan shopping joy. Victor loves to shop. And then, of course, my website. Um, our last sponsor today is my own website, alexiamusic.com, where you can find all things Alexian, including pagan music recordings and my online courses and training. Let me tell you, I am developing online music education courses for pagans with the Pagan Flare. They're already in development. I will also be doing some pagan Wiccan trainings, metaphysical trainings courses on my website as well. And of course, there is my private community, the Coven of Cool Cats. My ask my um, my public community, uh, the Facebook group, what they wanted to be called. And they said, Coven of Cool. And of course, that was a play on Cool to be a Witch, my well-known song. But I am, again, a priest of Bost, and I had to throw cats in there. So I did Coven of Cool Cats. And so that's the new uh, private community that's growing. That's the same community that Draken and Galena joined. And now they're private students of mine online studying for free. So um, today, I'm thrilled to throw into that Arcane Treasures giveaway a free membership to Coven of Cool Cats. It is a monthly membership ongoing. So you, whoever wins will be able to join into my private community and have some fun with us. So all three of these sponsors, especially Morgana Magic Spell, helped pay for today's show, the equipment, the streaming services, the staff, and all of the stuff that goes into producing this. So support them like they have helped support the show. And if you would like your business to become a sponsor, again, head over to alexianmusic.com slash sponsor. We'd love to have you on board. Okay, let's get back to the show. Going on. Who could it be? Who is next? Time for secrets from the Pagan Bookshelf. Up to up, bibbity do up. So coming up next on the show, we have a remarkable guest. He is the pagan author of the Llewellyn book, Strix Craft, a modern day seer, a high priest of the Minoan Brotherhood and of the Alexandrian tradition of witchcraft. Join us as we welcome a practicing priest of Hecate and a devoted follower of Dionysus. Please welcome pagan author and my dear friend, Oracle Hecatios. Hello. How are you doing, darling? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for being so patient. The, the show is running longer than I thought it would, but that's just because we got some good conversations happening, right? Well, the conversations have been very enlightening. And um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on your show. Um, I of think that that, I think this is very spectacular and it's very new and it's, and it's exciting. But I was uh, intrigued by the conversations that Mama Gina was having. Um, hey, Mel, um, to um, talk about, you know, the issues of of depression and even for myself, imposter syndrome at one point as an author. So um, that's very important. Those are very important topics because they are like the behind the scenes of what it is to be a writer or an artist that people don't often get to see. Like you were both were saying earlier, you know, people have to, they see the face, but they don't see the mask. 
right? Or rather, it's the opposite. They see the mask, but not the face. So, right. Um, as a Dionysian priest, I kind of had to put the mask in there, <laughs> the mask reference. But I mean, that's that's the nature of the beast. Absolutely. Now, some of you may know that you were actually part of my Alexandrian coven, Twisted Oak, and trained within my coven. But what they might not know is that you are actually also an ordained Christian minister. That's correct. Um, I was a licensed and ordained Christian minister many moons ago in another lifetime. It seems like a past life. I have so many past lives in this life. I don't even bother with past lives. <laughs> There's so many that, past brother. lives in this life enough to deal with, you know. But uh, yeah, no, um, I was a I was an ordained Christian minister in the Pentecostal Church, and um, I. Uh, I, I was um, I was already uh, had the title of minister at the age of, of, of seven, 16, 17 years old in the church. You see, in the church that I went to, um, if you are someone who's gifted, um, gifted, um, they frequently say that you're going to be a preacher. That's the language. That's the lingo that they use. You're going to be a preacher. And so they honed me to be uh, a minister because of my eidetic memory and because of my enunciation and just my thirst for knowledge at that time. So I ended up becoming ordained. And um, yeah, that was that was me. I had my own radio show, in fact, uh, for quite a little bit. And I had my own Saturday night service at another church for quite some time. And I traveled um, parts of South Florida to preach and in different churches and stuff. So I have experience doing that. I'm not, I w it wasn't just, you know, oh, I'm a minister and I graduated from, from this. No, I was very active in the South Florida area. Some people might not realize that I was the church organist for the Baptist church from 14 to 18. We all have a past. Sorry. <laughs> True story. We all I, have a pass. I looked um, out and I saw pentacles floating over the, the, the crowd. And then later when I was in college, I saw a pentacle on the book and the rest was history. Yeah, it's amazing the how, um, you know, how, how fate spins, you know. And, and I think that that's one of the things that I, I love talking about is, is fate. Not necessarily predeterminism, predeterminism philosophy, but just fate in itself, the weaving of our energies and how we all end up uh, meeting and we meet the people that we're supposed to meet because even in witchcraft, which is a personal journey, I feel that when you're a witch, you're not just training to be a witch, you're remembering what Absolutely. you once were. And so I feel that memory is such a powerful pull, um, you know, on, on our consciousness that I, it was inevitable that at some point I was going to end up in the craft. Um, I just believe that whether in the past or now, whatever. And, wow. you know, it's just, it was inevitable at some point that I was going to be here. Synchronicity and past lives coming through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the most powerful things uh, to talk about, you know, or that I mention a lot of times in my own writings and lecture is memory. The idea that uh, you know Nemosine, the Nemosini, the the muse of memory, how you know the the ancient Greeks talked about that. As long as you remembered the names and you remembered the people, um, that you could they could live on. They could live on the glory, Cleos glory could live on in the immortal soul, and uh, so people even adopted other people, couples adopted people, childless couples adopted children. So that way they could be remembered. So that way they could have that tangible, it was very tangible. Memory was not something that was just in ethereal it, uh, or a thought that was fleeting. It was palpable. And so I believe that that's palpable in witchcraft. So tell us about what you just finished. Well, I just finished, um, as far as a project is concerned, um, I just finished a mediumship panel with others. I happen to be a medium as well as an, as well as an oracle. Um, and so I finished up this panel with three others and we had a wonderful time, wonderful time. We had, it was limited to 10 people and um, everyone got a reading. Everyone was satisfied. The energy just flowed. It was just beautiful. 
as you would expect in a in a in a mediumship ceremony uh, where people were just uh, spirits were just coming in and out, inspiring the mediums to give messages to people. And uh, it was just an intense time and I really enjoyed it. So that was my most recent project. Where, where did this happen? Uh, this was in Coco Village. Oh, in Coco Village. Okay. Yeah, this was held in Coco Village at a at a in a classroom at a shop uh, known as Angels Oasis, and they were very gracious with the space and to allow us to uh, take the space and to really do it. We did it both virtually for virtual audience as well as in person. I for, I keep forget. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting to click the button on the left to keep advancing the show. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. It's like I, I go to the next guest, and then five minutes in, I the thing changes, right? It's okay. It happens. <laughs> There's a lot of buttons. Um, yeah, you're finding your footing. It happens. So um, you wanted to talk also today about gender identity within the craft. Let's talk about that, because I have things to share about that as well. Yeah, you know, I'm an assigned male at birth. I'm an AMAB, you know, but um, I am... I it, my, identify as as non-binary, as as NB. I'm outside of the gender spectrum, and um, I'm neither identify neither as a male nor as a female, but somewhere in between and a, a, away as a liminal creature. And I guess as a priest of Dionysus and Hecate, that would probably be like you know self-explanatory in certain areas, right? But I actually came to that identity after during my Alexandrian training. Um, is when my non-binariness began to manifest more and more, or rather not manifest, but as an acceptance of what I always had been. And um, I, um, I remember uh, accepting, accepting that role. And in fact, in another tradition that I'm a part of, um, the New York Wicca tradition, I, I was actually initiated in a same, in a same sex initiation, because that's allowed in that tradition. Um, as but I took the role of the priestess rather than the priest, which is you know so it I I, I both a priest and a priestess of the craft you know because that's mm -hmm. just the receptor as well as the projector, right? You know that just happens to be my energy and um, I'm very proud of that fact. I'm very proud of the fact that we are becoming pagans and witches are becoming more accepting of the fact and in a way we've always been accepting of gender fluidity but because it's becoming such a social marker in, in around the world we i'm finding that more and more are finding their home in the craft and in pagan and in neo-paganism and i think part of that reason is because we as pagans and witches we often have alternative hi david we all we alternatively have um different identities than our legal names you know we have magical identities that of what we are part of so i think it's very seamless and very expected that many people who identify outside the gender binary will identify in pagan neo-paganism and witchcraft so i have been approached by several different people from within the Alexandrian tradition and from outside the Alexandrian tradition talking about gender roles and priest and priestess roles and stuff. And I always tell the story of how my first experience with the first magic circle I ever had was, and this is a true story. Before I was initiated as an Alexandrian witch, young Alexian, this, this would have been circa 1988, like fall slash winter 1988, um, was initiated into more of an eclectic, just general Wicca type of initiation. It wasn't specifically Alexandrian. And the priestess who brought me into the circle pointed its sword at my chest and said... Why would I admit a man into the, the you know, the, the tradition or the, the, the secrets of the goddess, right? I was challenged based on my identity as a man. I go he, him, right? And um, 
my close my eyes. It, I was like, I don't know. Okay. Where did that come from? And I closed my eyes and this light came out of me. And I said, gender doesn't matter. What is eternal is the soul and the soul is of light and light has no energy. We only manifest these polarity roles in this dimension and this existence momentarily during this lifetime only to go on to manifest in another polarity. I have past life memories now that I didn't have back then as a woman couple of them in fact all right i also have a past life memory as a man being a priest in the mayan tradition but that's a whole nother story um the whole thing is it didn't matter it didn't matter and i was a soul showing up to worship that's what mattered and so I've held that answer that came out of my heart since the very beginning, close to my heart. And yes, we have had within my coven, which is Alexandrian, traditional Alexandrian, we have had gay people. I'm gay myself. We have had transsexual people. We have had lesbians, we have had straight women and straight men. And guess what? After leading this coven for over 30 years, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So I believe that people that get hung up on that stuff is a holdover from before. And we are evolving, as you basically said earlier, as a, a species. And we're realizing that it doesn't matter, that we're all spirit, you know, we're all more than what you see here. We are. And I think and that's a beautiful story. And I think it really harkens to the fact that even back then, you know, especially as, as gay men were excluded from the craft for quite some time, we were seen as extremely uh well i'm pansexual now as i identify but you know as a gay even as a even though i i have a same-sex relationship with somebody but um you know gay men were ex were excluded from from were were looked down upon in goddess worship you know and um because gay men were seen as too effeminate to embody the sacred masculine and uh and this is a true history of the craft yeah I mean, yeah, well, yeah, it's yeah. Really available you know but it's one of our darker periods in history and so uh one of the thing and and thankfully now i mean it's very difficult to find a straight priest in the craft i will be honest with you it's very it's i'm very hearing that find, but you know they're know there that, but i'm hearing that yes yeah you know they're there but one of the things that I think is is important to understand is that because I was growing up and I had sexual confusion about myself growing up, which helped to uh, kind of, you know, which was a which also opened my eyes to like what witchcraft could offer versus Christianity, um, because I was struggling. Um, I I did not have a traditional male role model. You know, I had. I, I didn't, you know, I had my father, but he was, he was not a toxic masculine man. And so um, he, and, and coming from a, um, a, a Hispanic background, because I am Hispanic, I'm Mexican American. Um, there's a lot of machismo in the, in, in, in our culture. And so a lot of that has to do with, you know, does, give birth to toxic masculinity but but um i was already being raised in an environment you know where i was just you know i i you know my i had mannerisms i have mannerisms that are that are more feminine than they are mass than they are masculine you know and i think some of our audience may know what i'm talking about but uh even still i think it's really important to identify to uh, to understand that we're just here to worship. That's it. Like you said, we're just here to show up and worship. And if you're yeah. not worshiping, then you're paying attention to the person next to you and you're worried about them. Why are you here? 
so many times i i've said this for decades now you know you have a squabble you have a witch war going over here you have this going on over there and i'm like meanwhile my coven is worshiping they're all arguing who's right and who's wrong we're worshiping we've been mm -hmm. practicing magic non-stop as you know oracle in this coven since 1993 mm -hmm. okay for over 30 years so I got a little bit of track record. I think I can say that out loud. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, anywho, that is a very interesting topic. And in fact, I'll add this and then we'll move on. When I draw down and I am high priest within circle, many people say that my energy shifts to very straight and very masculine. And I feel that because... When the goddess is drawn down into the priestess and the god is drawn down into me, all I want to do is be with her. All I want to do is embrace her and kiss her and be there with her. That It's like a magnetic attraction. So that energy enters me, that influence of, of the divine enters me, and, and it manifests as very much masculine, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still me right? Embodying that energy. And I'm definitely gay and I have my moments. <laughs> okay, moving on. Let's talk about your book. Yeah, Strixcraft, Ancient Greek Magic for the Modern Witch was published in the midst of the pandemic in 2020 um, by Llewellyn Publications. However, um, there is coming forward next year through Crossed Crow Books, a revised edition, which will have at least 10% more material than the book it has now. Oh, wow. Even more. Cool. Yes. Even more Strix Craft is coming. Uh, so so be prepared for more Greek, Greek uh, connections, Greek magic. And really what this book is about is it's very external focused. It's very external focused on magic, on magical practices, on ancient Greek, uh, it's and it's an adaptation of ancient. Uh, some of it is adaptations of ancient Greek magical practices. Some of it is not, and um, so which is uh, so. I talk about different things like honoring the dead. I talk about hexing and binding. I talk about love. I talk about uh, healing, healing magics. I talk about different things. I talk about the history of certain herbs. And uh, and from from Greek mytholo mythological point of view, and how they are integral to the practice, and how you know, and why they're there. Um, so, really, it's um, it's just um, really focused on that, and it's focused on tracing Hecate's worship through the through Thessaly, uh, which is a region in ancient Greece, which is a little bit north. And um, I know many people say that she is from uh, Anatolia or modern day Turkey, a region known as Karaya, but she also has some origins in Thessaly. And I think in my opinion, Hecate and like many other deities is very complicated. We don't really know what their origins are from. We just know that they've existed. And we know that there's been a mission mash of different cultures coming together to form and birth our gods and goddesses. That's my opinion anyway, my philosophy. I would agree with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so Oracle has also donated a copy of Strix Craft for the Arcane Treasures giveaway and it's autographed, guys. It's yeah. autographed. There you go. So stay tuned. You could win this book as well. So, yeah, and I do want to mention also that there is a sequel to that book coming out next year as well. That's right. You had told me that. Yep. There's a sequel coming out, which is more internal work, which is focused on philo philosophy and it's focused on the uh, etheric anatomy and it's focused on uh, just a lot of internal metaphysical concepts that were proclaimed both in ancient and late antiquity in ancient Greece. Very cool. What's the most humorous Outlanders fan comment or question that you've ever received? When are you coming back to Christ? <laughs> and I told them, I said the Lord's Prayer backwards and I sold my soul. I can't go back. <laughs> I undid my conversion. <laughs> well, see, from the stories that you've told us today, 
the path to Satan starts with becoming an ordained Christian ministry. <laughs> I Pretty much, it, it really does. It's just you a know, joke. Being... It's just a joke. It's just a joke. Don't get, <laughs> don't get upset. With you no, it, but it, 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 but it's, it's so funny. You know, uh, you know, there's, there's the whole, yeah, like Mel says, more and more. <laughs> But it's, you know, we have those old wood Italian woodcuts, right? Of people like, you know, offering their child to to the spirit of the horn god and uh, or a horn deity and kissing his backside and stuff like that. I'm like, well, you okay. know, I kiss somebody's backside, I suppose. I don't know. Depends on what he looks like. Depends on what he looks like. <laughs> Depends on whose backside it may be. Oh, goodness. We're, we're, we're de de getting degraded here. Um <laughs> It's bound to happen from time to time. Um, Especially if you have me on screen. <laughs> so I hear that you're supposed to be pure Greek. Uh, yeah, apparently I am. I am not. <laughs> so you had told I've me had, that I've had people uh, uh, ask me, and they're like, you know, uh, you know, are you Greek? Um, because right, right now, uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, political wise. Uh, Greece just allowed, which is a Christian nation, because church and state are united in Europe. I don't know if, how many Americans realize Europe is very different from the United States. But in Europe, many countries are church and state united. And so the church has a lot of power. And that's right, Mel, witches are going to witch. So what's happening is they just approved, <laughs> Justine, they just approved the legalization of Hellenic polytheism in Greece, there are Greeks actually worshiping the ancient Greek gods protected by the state. Isn't that amazing? And so that it's, it took it's this come long a long for, way. For the Greek gods to actually be worshiped once again legally in Greece. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And so there is a protectiveness, right, from the culture of, you know, who's going to be writing and how are they going to be writing and how will they portray the Greek gods and how will they portray the culture. And so there's a lot of protection over it, you know, because of because of the 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 state, the precarious state that Greek religion is in, even though Greek religion was an international religion uh, in ancient times. And, in you know, and in medieval times, you know, Greek religion spread everywhere during the Renaissance as well. Um, you know, there is still that cultural cohesiveness that identif that identifies somebody as Greek. So I was asked, I said, you know, are you Greek? And I said, no. I said, well, I said, I'm Greek in spirit. <laughs> you, know? you had also told me that somebody said it's about time that a pure Greek spoke about Greek. Yeah, they did. They said it's about time a pure <laughs> Greek spoke about Greek. And I was like, well, not quite. <laughs> so um, we're, we're really running over on time. So I'm going to kind of shortcut this. But um, would you like to talk uh, shortly about um, being disabled pagan and about your car accident yeah in brief I, I i'd be more than happy to thank you for that time no um in 2012 i was in a very bad car accident and uh yeah you know i will spare the details of the accident and how it happened but basically i, I sustained a traumatic brain injury and uh for a long time I, well for quite some time actually I, I i had trouble walking i had trouble with balance my my speech was was bad you know my my memory was was horrible my mood swings were just out of control it was bad it was very bad and i was in a very bad place physically mentally and emotionally right so um it was after that that i began my healing journey both in therapy and um you know and i began to really really dig in to my spiritual studies because my spirituality, I felt, was everything to me. You know, I had dedicated to Hecate in 2009 and, to, and, and then to Dionysus not so long after. So, you know, my, spiritual, my spirituality meant so much to me. And then so I had to dig in and really come to realize that there was, um, you know, a part of me that could be functional. But I am disabled. I'm a disabled pagan. I'm a disabled witch, and that hasn't stopped me, but I had to come to terms with my identity as a disabled person, that there are a lot of limitations to myself. And it's an invisible illness. It really is, because a lot of us don't have physical symptoms of 
anything wrong with us. I walk and I do things, but I have chronic headaches. I have epilepsy. I have, I have a lot of things that are wrong. And so, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm able to write and put out this thing, but it, it's, it's, it's an arduous process for anybody really. And they don't see a lot of the scars and they won't see a lot of the turmoil in writing. You know, you both spoke earlier beautifully about the process of artistry magic and lyricism and vocal and all that other stuff and being an artist you know writing is 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 not a quick it's not a cakewalk and even worse when you're disabled and you have your mind just you know your challenge because i had eidetic memory my memory is my long-term memory is one thing but my short-term memory forget it and you know the adhd you know is 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 bad in and of itself so i can get very distracted squirrel i can get very distracted easily <laughs> You so know. do Aries. I relate. <laughs> I'm an Aquarius. It's all good. <laughs> um, I, I know that after your 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 bad car accident, it was some time after that, but that's when you approached Twisted Oak and myself yes. about studying Alexandrian and becoming part of our coven, which you did. And yes. you did amazingly. And you you accelerated and you learned and you argued and and you know it all made everything better. You're, you have um, grown tremendously through the training, but at the same time, you left a uh, lasting impression upon this coven as well. So I know you need to hear that because uh, I don't know if anybody's told you that, but you have, and we love you for it. Thank you. Thank you. I will always cherish my memories with Twisted Oak and yeah. um, the growth that I found there and the camaraderie I found there and, you know, the family, you know, we have family that we find when we come back to the craft, right? Absolutely. So we find family from life to life and that's what this is all about. So let's bring on Draken. Surprise. Hey. <laughs> I popped back in real quick. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Uh, we do, but I need to like backtrack a little bit. Sure. Um, okay. Um, so Sandra is asking, what was your inspiration behind the song, The Eagle and the Owl? It's her favorite song. Ah, uh, cool. Oh, wow. Thank you, Sandra, for that question real quick, because I know we're short on time. Um, the local cups uh, always had other groups present and once a year this one particular group that would present would do this ritual that had been with them for a very long time and it was the eagle and the owl and it was a change of the seasons and you know the eagle would would at one point take over and then the owl and there was this lovely dance and um their matriarch passed away and the following year, they wanted to honor her and still do the ritual and present it for the cups group. And um, they approached me and said, but we're going to revise the ritual a little bit. And they asked me to write the music. And that was the chant that I wrote for them. How cool. So thank you so much, Sandra, for that question. I'm glad that you love you, that you love that chant. Any other questions? Um, that, that's it for the question. We had a lot of really good comments as we went along. I know I put them up on the screen. You guys maybe did or did not see them. You know, I know you can't always stop in the middle and, and read a comment, but I know that we've seen them all and appreciate, really appreciate everybody commenting. Um, it's, it's been great actually. <laughs> So I smell something really good coming from the other room. Victor. Yes. It's done. Woo, look at that. So it's not very clear, but uh, the chicken, it does, it's all in one pot. It's very easy to make. The chicken is tender. Uh, the peas are completely cooked. The rice is already cooked. So all you're doing is just letting the rice take the flavor of the chicken and the vegetables, and it's delicious. I know what Ooh. I'm having for dinner. Mm. I have dinner. You better believe it, brother. <laughs> mm, that's good. Not to brag, but that's good. You should brag. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has bragging rights. 
I well, I, you know, I'm so, those kind of. I know you live on the west side of town, Mama Gina, right? I live in Tampa, yeah. So I'm on the the west side of Florida. Well, if you ever come to Orlando, you know where to come to stay. I'm just going to follow the smell of the good food and drive right up. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Thank okay. you. Okay, so it is time to have a little fun. Draken, I'm going to put you back into your little cave. Thank you. But you'll be back in a sec. Um, we are going to play a little game with our guests. And those that are watching, um, you're going to enjoy this, but then we're going to get to that drawing. So that drawing is coming right up. But first, I need all of my guests to find the private chat. You are going to answer by typing one followed by your answer, then enter, and then two followed by your answer, and then enter, and three followed by your answer, and then enter in the private chat. Are we ready? Yes. Yes. Here is, I got to take that out. Here is your first question. What's the weirdest food combination that you've ever tried and actually enjoyed? What's the weirdest food combination that you've ever tried and actually enjoyed? Question two, if you could time travel, which era would you visit? If you could travel in time, which era would you visit? And question three, if you could have any celebrity be your personal assistant for the day, who would it be and what tasks would you assign them? If you could have any celebrity be your personal assistant for the day, who would it be and what tasks would you assign them? Ah, listen to that typing. Listen to all of that typing. <laughs> Time's up. Did y'all get your answers in? All right. Bringing back Draken. How okay. did we do? Do okay? We did okay, but um, I'm going to have to do this one at a time because... That's okay. When I post it, <laughs> so. I'm going to go with the order that they're on the screen. So it's going to be Victor, then Mama Gina, and then Oracle. So question one, Victor, what's the weirdest food combination that you've ever tried and actually enjoyed? Traditional British breakfast. They have sweet on uh, beans with grilled tomatoes and mushrooms, black sausage, and uh, eggs, and the most awesome bacon that is really just thick pieces of ham, but they call it bacon. It's, it, it doesn't make any sense, but it's heavy. Love it. Awesome. Draken, I think you're typing them into the comments instead of into the banners. I am. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so randomly, we're getting traditional uh, English uh, What was it? Breakfaster. There was a typo too. I'm just teasing you because it was fun. <laughs> All right, Mama Gina. Question one: What's the weirdest food combination you've ever tried and actually enjoyed? I I'm not. I've never been very ambitious when it comes to food. I don't try a lot of stuff. I mean, I it took me years to try sushi, and I love sushi, but it took me like years before I would even attempt it. I just I'm not very very ambitious, and in fact, the last what 11, 12 years now as a as a diabetic officially, I like eat lots of you know just raw or natural foods with not a lot of combination. So I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Not having an answer is an answer unto itself, right? <laughs> Oracle, same question. Um, fish and chips. 
<laughs> that was the weirdest food combination for you. For me, it, it, it yeah, it really was. I fish and chips were just something that I just was not expecting together on this platter. And I'm like, what is this? What is the fight? What is the kind of fish that this is? You know, I'm not a big fish eater. And so and, and I, I like it. Okay. You would not make a good Englishman. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two, Victor, if you could time travel, which era would you visit and why? The Renaissance, because they were so comfortable with nudity. Uh, you could be naked anytime, and it was all art. That's my kind of people. I think you're experiencing the Renaissance through paintings. I don't sure. I'm not so sure. If people walked around nude all the time. I would say that the world is my painting, so I would be painting <laughs> everywhere. Get naked. I'm gonna paint you. Yes, in this household, we kind of, you know, go on natural a lot. I think a lot of pagans do. Mama Gina, same question. Yeah. I, I want to be 10, 20, 30,000 years in the future and see what's happening. One of my uh, songwriting entities that comes through me uh, had a whole album she walks the stars and it's all based 30,000 years in the future in the milky way and i feel like i lived her life and um i want to go i want to have some fun very cool very cool oracle if you could time travel where would you go and why modern times baby and <laughs> plumbing um... <laughs> air conditioner wi-fi you know what I'm i saying? feel you brother i feel you you know, modern times, I would not, you know, I would not switch it out for, for, for a plague. And, He's a and I would not, and literacy, literacy is very important to me. <laughs> you know what? I'm changing my answer. I'm going with Oracle. <laughs> Look, indoor plumbing all the way. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Last question. If you could have any celebrity be your personal assistant for a day, who would it be and what tasks? Would you assign them, Victor? I love Sandra Bullock. I love, love, love Sandra Bullock. I, you know what? She can do whatever she wants because <laughs> I love her. I love her, love her, love her. So Sandra Bullock, if you see this, I'm in love with you. I love you. Please come, I'll cook for you. Oh my goodness. That would be like a dream come true. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mama Gina. You know what? I can't think that fast. I, I don't even know. Maybe somebody beautiful so they could just stand there all day. I, I And just let me look. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't ask people to do stuff for me very much. So Maybe we've uh, discovered a weakness. Maybe you it, need more assistance. Oh, huge weakness. <laughs> it's okay to ask for help, Mama Gina. Uh, yes, sir. I will remember that. Orlando Bloom, but he just has to not talk and look pretty. I know there, there are three kinds of men in the world. Okay. There are the kind that you can read the phone, they can read the phone book and you fall in love with them. There are yeah. the kind that shut up and look pretty. Silence is golden, but duct tape is silver. And the third type are the rare that combine both. Yeah. Like oh. Tom Ellis. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, Oracle, what was your celebrity? David Archuleta. Oh, he's cute. He is. He's very cute. I fan me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Beat the grapes and fan me. me. Do whatever. I'm good to go, and I will return the favor a thousandfold. <laughs> So I thought it would be fun for Draken to answer these questions as well oh. as myself. So Draken, um, what's the weirdest food combo? Um, see, that's a hard one for me because I will eat literally anything except okra. I like. Don't do the slimy, eh? No, it's it was the okra and tomato thing, but like even the fried okra stuff about it, I can't do okra. But I have some really weird things in my life in different countries, and loved all of it. So, uh, yeah, 
love you're adventurous I, like victor i love to food i love to food and time traveling time traveling you know what i would not want to go backwards i would want to go either now or forward because i think about how i think about this all the time think about what things were like when we were in high school okay we were in high school before the interwebs, before social media, before everyone had a camera on their phone. And I think all this has happened in just a short few decades, right? What's it going to be like two decades from now? Like, I cannot wait. Like, I hope that I'm around for a really long time because I want to see what's happening in the future. I cannot wait. Yeah. And your celebrity. Oh, my celebrity, um, Jason Statham. I love okay. Jason Statham, and I cannot tell you on this show what I would have him do for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, similar to yours, <laughs> but a different Jason. So what's the weirdest food combo? I have to say it, baby. Bacala what is it called? Bacalao? Bacalao. Oh, come on. <laughs> Delicious. Now, I'm supposed oh, to say what I actually enjoyed, so that wouldn't apply, but... Whatever. If I could time travel, I would go forward in time as well, only if it's a happy future. So, mine comes with a clause about mm -hmm. dimensions as well. <laughs> and what celebrity? That would be Jason Momoa. <laughs> And I would not mention on this broadcast what we would be doing as a tag. Sign me up. I <laughs> saw a picture online of him and a loincloth in Hawaii. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's just so down to earth. That's why it's so attractive. Yeah, you know? sure. That's that's what is attractive. That, that he's down to earth. That bud has nothing yes. to do with it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You can do all the things. All the things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I hope you all enjoyed that. So finally, that teaser I teased at the beginning of the show. Now that you've heard from all of our guests, which one do you think viewers is the guest that climbed that roman castle in turkey remember i talked about that at the very beginning of the show who do you think climbed that roman castle in turkey i want you to type a one in comments if you think it's victor i want you to type a two if you think it was mama gina and i want you to type a three if you think it was oracle again Someone in our guests uh, on the stage today climbed a Roman castle in Turkey. Who do you think it was? One for Victor, two for Mama Gina, or three for Oracle? Okay. We've got a three for Oracle. So far, we got one vote. Mm -hmm. Three for Oracle. <laughs> one for Victor. Two for Mama Gina. It's so looking like Oracle is winning. Okay. The majority think it was Oracle. Will the will the real Roman castle climber please raise their hand? <laughs> it was Mama Gina. True story. Mama True story. Gina. I was on I was on a tour, a Department of Defense tour, uh, many, many, many years ago with a band and um, the our assignment person from the base said, you have some, you have the day off, you wanna go castle climbing. We were uh, stationed at Injur, like outside of Ankara and about an hour away was an old Roman castle. And uh, he said, we have to stop on the way and pick up a couple of things. <laughs> he stopped in the market in Ankara and picked up a pack of ballpoint pens and two bags of baklava. And we ate one bag of baklava on the way to the to the mountain with the castle on it. And uh, we got there and we parked and out comes this old woman that looked like a National Geographic cover. I mean, her face was all lines and she was really, really old and beautiful in that really old sort of way. And um, he gave her the ballpoint pens 
and the other bag of baklava, and evidently that was the bribe so that her sons would not strip the truck while we went to climb the castle. <laughs> <laughs> And we did. We had we had an amazing afternoon and met a goat on the side of the castle that almost knocked one of us out down the mountain. It was great. It was great. Oh so, my yeah, god, that's it so was awful. me. What an amazing story. Good times. We all have those stories, but that that's just a cool story, isn't it? I that love it. Awesome. Reminder, well, guys, you have been so patient. Justine, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Yeah, Jessie's up dad, so remind her what that story was. I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, Justine had stepped out and remind her what the story was that Mama Gina just told. Oh, at the beginning of the show, Justine, I had said one of our viewers actually climbed a Roman castle in Turkey. <clears throat> Stay tuned to find out who. And we just revealed that it was Mama Gina that did climb an actual ancient roman castle in the country of turkey so that's yep. what that was all about because it was all rome back then it was, yeah, <laughs> that it is was true rome. yeah all right you guys have been so patient we are at the end of the show and it is time to finally roll your luck to win the arcane treasures giveaway so this is what you're going to do you are going to type What's in the ticker at the bottom of the screen, which is hashtag arcane, A-R-C-A-N-E, hashtag arcane. Type that into the chat in YouTube and it will automatically count our entries. So far, we got one entry. You're winning. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give this like a minute. For everybody to um, put their entries in. So we have 10 people watching. So there should be 10 entries. We're up to four. S hashtag arcane. All you got to do is type it into the YouTube chat and hit enter. And you're good to go. Um, and you're, whoever wins is winning it all. It's a one, it's all for it's all in one pot, all in one big giveaway grab bag. You get the book from uh, uh, Oracle that's autographed. You get the kitchen witchery magnet. You get the PDF of the Sangria Give It To Me drink from Victor. You get the Oracle 24 page booklet from Morgana Magic Spell. You get the download of Don't Trust a Girl with a Guitar from Mama Gina. You get the $25 um, gift certificate coupon from pagan music and you get a free membership to coven of the cool cats on my alexian website and i think i said every every price i'm not quite sure but we have four entries so there's six people watching that are going to abstain from winning five half of you have done it okay i'm going to give you the countdown clock i'm going to give you the countdown clock you got you got one minute to enter here we go Five entries, 50 seconds, and we roll the dice. Forty-five. <laughs> think I'm winning, guys. I'm excited. <laughs> Oracle popped off. I think he's going to go in her. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully his battery on his computer didn't go dead. Uh, Probably the internet, yeah. All right, 10 seconds. Arcane. Hashtag Arcane. Four, three, two, one. Here we go. Good luck, everyone. And the winner is Janet Winston. Congrats to you. Away. Please email me, Janet, directly at lordalexian at gmail.com. 
to claim your treasures. I want to express a deep heartfelt thank you to all of my guests and sponsors today. And thank you so much for joining me. Draken and I will be back next month along with new guests, including Ginger Ackley, a paper recording artist known for her show Enchantica. Everyone have a wonderful, fabulous day. See you next month. Lost blessings.